tribal trails, tribal trails. The Son of God, He is near. He chose to walk with us. These tribal trails, tribal trails. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Hi and welcome to Tribal Trails. Today we're here with Dr. Gary Parker. Welcome to the program. <laughs> the Bible says in Psalm 19, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. And then another scripture says, I think it's in Romans or something, that people are, are without excuse, that God shows mm -hmm. himself through nature. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, I'd love to tell you more about that. <laughs> and uh, uh, wow, uh, sometimes people wonder, why did God create all of these other things? But you know, when you read even Jesus' words, he's constantly using examples from nature to illustrate a point. The seed is the Word of God. The seeds that fell along the path stand for those who hear, but the devil comes and takes the message away from their hearts in order to keep them from believing and being saved. The seeds that fell on rocky ground stand for those who hear God's message and receive it gladly, but they have no roots. They believe only for a little while, and when a time of testing comes, they fall away. The seeds that fell among the thorns stand for those who hear. But the worries and riches and pleasures of this life crowd in and choke them. And their fruit never ripens. And the seeds that fell on good soil stand for those who hear the message and it remains in a good and obedient heart. And they persist until they bear fruit. What is the kingdom of God like? It is like this. A man takes a tiny mustard seed and plants it in his field. It grows and becomes a tree. And the birds make their nest in its branches. The kingdom of God does not come in a way that can be seen. No one will say, look, there it is, or here it is, because the kingdom of God is in your heart. The time will come when you will wish that you could see the return of the Son of Man but you will not see it. As the lightning flashes across the sky and lights it up from one side to the other, that's how quick the Son of Man will be on his day. And God created a lot of other things uh, really to draw us toward himself. And so, as you said, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day to day pours poor speech, night to night declares knowledge. There's no voice, you don't have to translate it. Mm. It's a, a sermon that's understood by all peoples, all times, all places, just about all ages. And, uh, uh, you know, I've told you before, I was a science nerd from like this. Mm. <laughs> and like every other child, you just, you look up at all those bright spots of light in the sky, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, awesome to think about, you know, could I ever go there? What's, what's God trying to tell us? Sometimes evolutionists try to say, well, you know, if God created life just on earth, what's the point of all this other stuff? Why did God make all this? You know, it just looks like, a, as one movie put it, a waste of space. But no, God gave us these other things as object lessons. You know, he tells us how yeah. special the earth is. But every time we visit, you know, another one of these planets, 
we find out, wow, you told us, God, how special the Earth is, but boy, oh boy, is it special. Uh, when I was young, they thought Venus was our sister planet. Uh, so it's about the same size as the Earth. Uh, it's closer to the sun, but it's also shrouded in, in clouds that reflect a lot of sunlight. So the idea was, even though it's closer to the sun, it ought to be a lot hotter, but it's got these reflective clouds everywhere, not just little patches, but all over. That's why it's the, uh, you know, the, the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and so they thought, under those clouds, there's, there's probably life could even be intelligent life. It could be a planet we could colonize. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I want to go, I want to go. <laughs> well, finally, you know, science got there. And that was one thing I was, that intrigued me about science, was exploring the unknown like that. Uh, but kind of sad news in a sense. So the first spacecraft that, you know, penetrated those beautiful clouds, the glowing clouds around Venus, uh, the message come back to Earth was something like, ah! <laughs> so the, the clouds are sulfuric acid mist. And so they're just corroding the spacecraft like crazy. And then the atmosphere is, oh, just super abundant in carbon dioxide, uh, which holds in the heat so much that the surface temperature would melt lead. <laughs> so <laughs> turned out it wasn't really our sister planet after all. You know, it's not even colonizable, you know, let alone having colonies already there. But that's only the beginning of uh, the uniqueness of uh, the planet Venus. God makes... You know, things unique, special, each one with a place that reveals something about his character, something about our planet. And uh, uh, among other things, Venus rotates backwards. And of course, you know, I was an enthusiastic evolutionist, so I was teaching my students, you know, that uh, the common thing you hear, you know, is that uh, after the Big Bang, you know, there were uh, gas balls, and some of these gas balls begin to condense, you know, and, and they made, got so dense, they begin to glow, you know, and became stars, and then the colder material around the edges that didn't become the star, you know, were circling around, and then clumps of that cold matter got together to form planets. Mm -hmm. Well... You have to violate a lot of laws of physics to make that happen. <laughs> but if you did, if you were able to succeed in doing that, well, of course, everything would be spinning in the same direction. Venus is rotating backwards. Okay, And uh, Uranus is another planet. Two out of the eight or nine, depending on Pluto, <laughs> are going backwards. It's as if God is saying to us, okay, spin that down from a gas cloud. <laughs> it just doesn't work. A third of the satellites, the moons that uh, revolve around the planets, r revolve backwards. And so God's really pointing out, no, no, you know, I can make things unique. I can make each thing special, and I can show you how special your planet is compared to these other ones. For this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Not only does Venus rotate backwards, but its day is longer than its year. Okay, so it goes backwards and it rotates once every 243 Earth days. It takes, it's really slow about rotating, but it only takes 225 Earth days to go around the sun. And so on Venus, a day is longer than a year. And it's super hot, sulfuric acid mist, and it, but it's got the most nearly perfectly circular orbit. And so uh, evolutionists don't talk a lot about Venus, okay, for obvious reasons. <laughs> it just <clears throat> what, what are the reasons why they don't talk about it? Yeah, and it's spinning the wrong direction. It's spinning the wrong rate. And it has this nearly perfectly circular orbit. It's the most circular. And so uh, whenever evolutionists see something freaky like that, well, I said, oh, you know, what, what, what are we going to do? And so the, the, uh, what they're doing now is, well, it must have been an asteroid. 
a big chunk of rock somehow broke loose and, and you know, passed close by Venus and the, the gravitational tug of war between this big asteroid and Venus, you know, it used to rotate the way it was supposed to according to evolutionary theory, but this asteroid, you know, braked it to a halt and just started it moving the other direction, you know, slowly. And, oh, uh, you got any, where, where, so you've seen this asteroid? Oh, no, no, we, we don't know where it came from. Uh, where's it going now? Well, I don't know. We, we can't find it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, an unknown asteroid from an unknown origin. And, but could it do that? And the answer is no. Uh, planets could possibly interact. Big things, you know, could influence each other's gravity like that. But instead of getting a circular orbit, you get a stretched out elliptical orbit, a big oval. Okay, and so that would be an evidence for some kind of planetary interaction disturbing, you know, a more regular pattern. Well, okay, what, what object got demoted from planet to non-planet? I don't know which one. <laughs> yeah, Pluto, and Pluto's been in the news a lot recently. And interestingly enough, one of the reasons they, they demoted Pluto originally, in my opinion, uh, they've made up stuff about size and so on, but the planets also rotate in a flat plane. So here's the sun, everything's going around pretty much in the same plane, uh, maybe up to five degrees difference, except Pluto. So Pluto's orbit compared to the others is tilted about 17 degrees, and its orbit is stretched out as an oval, elliptical orbit, in fact, so stretched out uh, you know, when we were kids, we learned that, uh, you know, Pluto was the planet farthest away from the sun. And for about 180 out of 200 years, uh, it is. But for about 20 years, it actually, because its orbit is so egg-shaped, so elliptical, it's inside the orbit of Neptune. Neptune's the farthest planet away. And so if, if you wanted to make a case, if an evolutionist wanted to make a case for a planet being disturbed by something else, it seems like they kind of shot themselves in the foot. They ought to keep Pluto as a planet. And so you don't, we haven't seen anything that disturbed its motion, but at least it has the characteristics of disturbed motion. But then that counteracts the evolutionary argument for Venus. And so it looked like they just decided, well, let's just get rid of it. We won't call it a planet and everybody will lose interest. Mm -hmm. And then the New Horizons spacecraft went by. <laughs> and boy, oh boy, did that rekindle interest. Even the news media talked about it as a planet. And usually they're the last ones to catch on to yeah. <laughs> anything. And, and, you know, it had features. Of course, they call it young. Now, by their standards, young means just a few hundred million, you know. But and by the way, uh, Pluto also has moons. Uh, one was known before, uh, Charon or Charon, C-H-A-R-O-N, and then it's got three others. And so, you know, planets have moons. You don't have just rocks that, you know, uh, they can revolve around one another, but not in the orderly fashion like you see with Pluto. And uh, so it looks like, you know, God is telling you again, it didn't spin down from a gas cloud, you know, and if, you, if you're trying to say the orbits were affected by other planetary bodies, then you better look for the characteristics you see in Pluto, but Pluto's the only one that shows it, and they don't want it for Pluto, they want it for Venus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I remember when they started sending, I'm pretty old, okay, so when they started sending spacecraft out, uh, you know, looking at other things, close-ups of comets and asteroids and other worlds and, and so on, the uh, uh, newspaper man interviewed one of the leading scientists and he said, oh, he says, I suppose you're really excited about this spacecraft that's, uh, you know, going to be taking a close-up look at this object in space. And the scientist replied, he says, no, not really. He said, every time we send one of these probes into space to look at something, we have to change all our theories. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise God, yeah. we don't. Of what God tells us to start with about the uniqueness of Earth, the, the orderliness of His universe, God made things so that we could never make the mistake of assuming the universe made itself. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. 
You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Now, the universe is a created object. In fact, speaking of created objects, <laughs> now uh, here's a little carving in jade. Yeah. Yeah, just magnificent. Yeah. And nobody's going to say, well, gee, that's a product of time and chance. You know, that yeah. just happened as a piece of jade, you know, tumbled down a river, or fell off a mountain, or got spit out of a volcano. Yeah. Uh, they're going to see handiwork. They're going to see plan and purpose. And God made the, the planets around us to illustrate plan and purpose and to reinforce his message of Earth's uniqueness. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just Venus. Each one of the planets has something special. Uh, Jupiter is another one. Uh, Venus and Jupiter, uh, sometimes Saturn, are sometimes called morning and evening stars. Now, in this case, star just means point of light in the sky. Uh, the name planet uh, from the Greek means wanderer. And so the stars, as we look at them, you know, they, they rotate. It's actually the Earth that's rotating, but it makes it look like they, but they stay in the same relationship to one another. Well, in Greek, planetes means wanderer. And so there are a few things like Venus that, you know, come up in the morning sky, go down, come up in the evening sky, go up, come down, go back to morning. Jupiter does that. And, um, uh, and so these meant, well, something's different going on here. And so these are also, well, I'm going to say revolving around the sun. But that's not quite right. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, the Bible said everything revolved around the earth. No, the Bible never said that. Mm -hmm. The earth is not the center of the universe. Jesus Christ is the center of the universe. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me position, you know, is gives us a, uh, 
a view of God's handiwork. Yeah. If we were actually in the center of our galaxy, for instance, we couldn't see out because of all the dense starlight around us. Now he put us two thirds of the way out on the edge so we could see all the rest of his handiwork. Mm. And so it's Christ that's the center, not earth by any means. And that wasn't taught in the Bible. That was the words of a pagan astronomer named Ptolemy. He taught that everything revolved around the earth. And the church made a mistake in Galileo's day kind of like the mistake the church is making today. They took a pagan idea that wasn't in the Bible to start with, Ptolemy's idea, everything revolved around the earth, and began to teach it as church doctrine. Well, when that view was falsified, it made the church look bad, but it wasn't the church's idea. It wasn't the Bible teaching anyway. The mistake, the so-called Galilean mistake, Sometimes evolutionists use that say, see you Christians, you better not say anything. Uh, better not use science because then you'll be proved wrong like Galileo proved the Bible wrong? No. Galileo proved a pagan astronomer was wrong. Mm. And evolutionists to the church leaders today, they're the ones making the Galileo mistake when they baptize evolution and say God used evolution to create things. Then when science shows evolution doesn't work, evolution's wrong. You know, it doesn't make the Bible look bad. It makes compromising Christians look bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Jupiter's really good for that. So this is a great big gas ball planet, and you can see it with just a cheap telescope. Uh, and it's rotating so, it's big. Okay, it's 10 times bigger in diameter, you know, more than a thousand times bigger in volume than the Earth, but it spins so fast a day on Jupiter is nine hours and 50 minutes. Yeah. Wow, for that great big huge thing. And it's a big gas ball. So that the gas clouds, you know, make bands because it's rotating so fast, it's almost straight up and down the axis of rotation. And there's a mysterious, uh, you know, this is God and actually a red spot. And it's thought to be something like a rock and a stream so all these clouds are going by, but because there's a little interruption, you know, it makes turbulence, you know, just like a stream flowing down hits yeah. a rock and it kind of, you know, disrupts the pattern. Well, that way you can watch that red spot go around and you can see how fast the planet's rotating. And when I, when I teach, uh, you know, astronomy, I have the kids, they can watch it. I can show it to them at night class. I can let them look at Jupiter before class, do the class, go out and look at it at the end of the class, uh, three hours later, and it's already moved. They can already see it going because it's going to go all the way around in nine hours and 50 mm -hmm. minutes. And that's pretty dramatic. And uh, in fact, it has something called angular momentum, okay? And uh, it's, we call it spin energy. And so Jupiter's kind of going like this. Well, according to Big Bang Theory, the angular momentum, the spin energy, if you had this gas cloud that condensed, you know, think of an ice skater. That's pretty easy to do in Canada. Could even think of a pirouetting hockey player, but that's kind of a, nah, you don't want that image. <laughs> okay, so, but at any rate, <laughs> you know, if they have their hands out like this, you know, they're spinning fast, but if they pull them in, they psh, yeah. you know, and then they want to slow down, they can put their hands out again. And so that's the law of conservation of angular momentum. And it's based on how rapidly you're spinning and how far you are from the center. And, uh, and so uh, looked at that way, 98% of the spin energy in the solar system is in the planet Jupiter. If Big Bang Theory were correct, it should be in the sun. The sun should be gone like that and the planet's less so. And so it looks like God took Jupiter and just like that, mm -hmm. spin that one down from a gas cloud. <laughs> so everything we see in God's handiwork are declaring the glory of God. They're calling us to fellowship with Him. Say, like, look how unique I made the planets. Yeah. And look how special I made the earth. You don't have that problem, you don't have this problem. I didn't give you a sulfuric acid mist atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't heat you up to this temperature of melting lead. I didn't make you spin so fast that yeah. <laughs> your head would swim, you know. And, uh, really encourages us to trust God for all the things uh, that He yeah. said to us. The more we learn, keep that in mind. Yeah. If you believe God, yeah. the more you learn about His world, the more you're going to appreciate His Word. Yeah. Right on. That's that's so neat how 
God through nature shows himself that everything that he created is so unique mm -hmm. through the planets and that, but also in the body of Christ that we, he created us with different gifts and we are all unique. Yeah. It's yeah. neat how he shows us through nature, like Psalm 19 says, the heaven declares the glory of God. His glory sh is shown through nature and also through the church body, through each one of us. Mm -hmm. And it's so neat. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. And that, that builds a relationship of love yeah. and interaction and cooperation. It's not a Darwinian take all winners, you know, struggle for survival. And the only way to get ahead is to put somebody else down. You know, that's that sense of competition and climbing over somebody else, you know, you, yeah. uh, to get to the top, you know, looking out for a numero uno, number one, you know. Yeah. I know in Christ we can all help each other be all we can be in Christ. It ties us together, unites us in a love that reflects the love between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for sharing with us today. My pleasure again. to work.